Got your Bibles, James chapter 5. James chapter 5. James chapter 5. When you get it, let me see that Bible opened up on page 965 in my Bible. Has your Bible now, just when you open up the Bible, does it fall open on the book of James yet? <laughs> it does, doesn't it? Isn't that great? I love that. Do what? Okay, I got all excited. Yeah, you just... Yeah. First John, yeah, you know, it's just right there. So, you know, that's, yeah, Peter, you know, you get there. So, James, man, my Bible's all marked up, and, and uh, uh, this is the one I've been preaching from for a while, and then I have a study Bible that's all marked up at my, on my desk, and, and, uh, and then my Greek Lexington Bible's all messed up, messed up, messed up, <laughs> written up, you know. I've got all these writings on there, and so uh, one day my kids are going to have my Bible uh, and I've written uh, dates that I've preached on and notes here, so hopefully they'll go, no wonder Dad was tired all the time. So anyway, there's just a lot of words here. My, my notes are about, I don't know, I didn't measure, but I have probably six inches full of papers that I've taken notes just on the book of James. And so obviously y'all know this because I'm long-winded on that deal. So we're going to be looking at James chapter 5. You got your Bibles yet? Show me. Let me see your Bibles up. Hold them up there. Yeah, there we go. Lord, we thank you for our Bibles. We thank you for the Word of God that speaks love, but also speaks discipline, direction, and purpose in our life. Lord, we love the book of James. It's pointed right at us. We can't dodge these spiritual bullets, nor do we even desire to. Father, we just want to you know, immerse ourselves today through your Holy Spirit to learn what you have for us this day. It's a tough one. You know that. It's a lot of confusion. But Father, give me the, the uh, understanding way beyond my understanding. Lord, did you speak to me today concerning this thing called suffering? Lord, we love you. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. The book of James doesn't let us off the hook, does he? I mean, he's, he's led by the Holy Spirit of God. He doesn't sugarcoat or candy coat anything that we've been looking at. He talks about our responsibility to our relationship with God, our responsibility to our relationship with others in the community of believers. And then he talks about our relationship to ourselves on this journey called faith. And so he's, he's been talking about this. He's led us right up to this section, and he puts the hammer down. Now, we're in the last chapter of the book of James. Have y'all realized, do y'all realize that? We're in James chapter 5. This is it. And you'd think he'd kind of soften it up. You know, if you want to be a minister and you want to be asked to return back to a church, if you're a guest speaker, the last message, it's got to be a little softer, right? So they'll go, boy, that was good. He really lifted us up. You know, the, all the week was hard. You know, I used to do evangelistic uh uh, I traveled around a lot and did that, and the last sermon was kind of an uplifting to the church, you know, as always, so they'd invite me back, right? <laughs> Y'all have no idea what I'm talking about, do you? <laughs> yeah, but James doesn't do that. I mean, he's putting the hammer down. I mean, he just talked about how, 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 we, how some people are taken advantage of because of the wealth, and we just finished this huge sermons about greed and it was tough and it and it hurt because we all had to admit well, yeah we've got a little bit of this in us and we we've identified that and we've we we all as a individuals and collectively repented from that and you think he'd let let up a little bit but he doesn't he dives into this subject called suffering and we all struggle with that and there's a lot of confusion there and I'm hopefully I, I will help understand this. So, but let's, let's kind of take us on this journey here. So the theme of James is faith without works is what? And so then he begins, is dead. And so then he begins this, how do we maneuver our lives and manage our life as followers of Jesus Christ? How do we manage this thing called faith and how does it work? Remember what he said? He said, faith would be controlling your tongue. That's a tough one, right? Faith would be con con controlling the way that you handle temptations and testings in your life. 
And then he goes on to say that your faith should not be foolish wisdom of the world, but it should be wisdom that comes from God. Then he says your faith should, show, show, should not show favoritism the way somebody dresses or doesn't dress. Dress is not an issue in, in the fellowship of God. And there's no judgment there. And so he talks us, how does our faith look at people? How do we treat without favoritism? But understand this, he says that faith works. He's not talking about salvation faith. He's talking about once you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord through faith, through the gift of God called grace, after you receive that, how does faith work in your life? And that's where James is taking us. And then he lays the hammer down. What does faith look like when God doesn't show up in the way that he, we want him to show up? Ever been there before? This means yes. The rest of you are just lying. Okay. It does. We, we get impatient with this, especially in the area that we're going to be looking at. We're going to look at five things. We're only going to look at one today <laughs> because, because this is a tough one. But we're going to be looking at five over the course of the next two Sundays probably so we can kind of maneuver through this. I thought this was a one sermon deal, but once I get into it, I find that, oh my goodness, there's so much here. Now, at first glance, the title of the message is, How does faith work when you're in a hurry? And what? Read the rest of it. God isn't. God isn't. Anybody there? Yeah. Hurry up, God. Hurry up, God. Especially in the area when we're suffering. We want God to get, get over this and under this and through this so that we can hurry up and get better. Now, at first glance, I, I looked at this. I wrote this down. I said, at first glance, I look at this and said, well, that's not that big of a deal. What's, what's the urgency about this? This isn't a tough thing. We just say, well, that's God's timing and, and, and you know, God's timing, God's purpose, and we don't understand it all, so it, it, it's okay. And yet, this, it's called theoretically understanding. Theoretically, we, we, we understand that God has a timetable different than ours, right? And God can do whatever he wants to do, right? He doesn't need our permission. He doesn't even need my blessing. He doesn't need my agreement on that. God's going to do whatever he wants to do. And God operates out of time, space, and matter. I've told you that a million times. And so in that, he gives us time and days just for our finite minds. His infinite mind, he doesn't operate that way. And so in that process here, that, 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 that theological understanding, that we, we have this, we understand it up here, but the experiential knowledge is a whole different ball game. You know what I'm saying? We can all say this and make a declaration. You know, God's timing is God's timing. And he's going to do what he wants to do. And we believe that up here. But we have to experience that in the real world. And that's where it gets a little cloudy. Why God waits? And why does God not respond in a timely way that we think he should? And if God really loved me, wouldn't he get me out of this mess? And wouldn't he wouldn't cause suffering in the things of this world that we see all around us day by day? Now, I think, I think it's, it's true, especially in our world today, that we, we get these, these bad reports sometimes in our life. You know, somebody's in a car wreck, a loved one, and they don't make it out. Or you get the news that you have a, a terminal disease and a and traumatic tumors all in your body, you know, news that, that we're getting from on my side of the family and some, you know, with my son-in-law and just all these things. And we hear these things, you, you, you lose your job, you go through suffering, you, you get a divorce, you, you trust somebody and they're, they're unfaithful to you or, uh, uh, you know, uh, your, your children or finances, you get fired from a job, whatever it is, we, we all go through that. And we go through these times of suffering and hardship and, and we want, we want something to change. We want to stop the hurt, right? We want something to, to, to kind of ease up on the, the hurt, the pain that we're having, and, and nothing happens. We pray every moment because the declaration that we have to God in our prayer life is altered because of something that, that causes us this shadow, this, this suffering that we have. And, and every prayer kind of goes back around to that issue. Lord, I need relief here. I want to, can I, would you stop this? And we don't hear from heaven. And nothing happened. Nothing changes. What do we do? I mean, we've probably all been there. Well-intended pastors and friends would say, well, you know, just go around it. You know, God's got that for a reason, and you just have to go around it. I'm not, I'm not that guy. Because I think m more times, rather than 
asking God to remove that mountain or, or, or help us to go around it. God really wants us to go through it. And there it is. And we don't like it, but there's a process there. And the process is always greater than the destination. That's a pretty good statement right there. Somebody doesn't write that down. I, I don't know if you're going to make it to heaven or not. But anyway, <laughs> that was my July the 27th devotional, and I had to read it four or five times. I shared it with one of my best friends, and, and we went over it four or five times. Just we broke that devotional down. And the process is, is the reward from God. It's not the destination. I'll explain a little bit more than that. I'm going I'm to build a sermon on that too, by the way. You know, God's plans, our plans, all right? Y'all want to hear that now? Okay, now we'll go on with this. All right. <laughs> Here's the truth about this. We're going to have storms, tribulations in our life. James kind of prepped us earlier. Remember James chapter 1, verse 2? Count it all what? Joy. Some of y'all go, you know, we didn't like that. that we don't like that. How many like that verse? No, y'all are sick if you like that. Count it all joy when you go through various trials and tribulations. So he's kind of prepped us for this. So, so right. So now he said, uh, you know, count it all joy when you face, you know, the, the trials that you go through. And now James is going to tell us something different, even harder, I think. James is going to say, not only count it all joy when you go through trials and suffering, he's going to say, be patient. Are you kidding me? He's going to tell us, to, the joy was the hard, that was hard enough, right? You know, you know, just smile away, you know, that's not what it meant, but you know, and then he says, be patient. That's the last thing I want to hear when I'm, when I'm suffering and I'm going through hardship and, and, and difficulties in my, that is the last thing I want to hear. Anybody with me on that? Just being honest. Anybody prayed for patience before? Don't do it. <laughs> Who did you got scar tissue? Share, share your scar tissue from that one, Dale. You know, I prayed for patience once. I'm like, ah, you know. It's funny how God operates in the smallest ways when you pray for patience, right? I heard a cute little story about little Johnny. Little Johnny wanted a pet, and his mom and dad said, no, you, don't, you won't take it. But finally, little Johnny went out in the backyard, and he found a centipede. You know what a centipede is? A centipede. Yeah, yeah. He named it Carl, and he Carl the centipede, and, and he had it in a box. And one day he went to school, and... The teacher announced there's going to be bring your pet to school day, right? And it said that we're going to have a competition. If you bring your pet to school day, I'll also dress up your pet because we're going to have a competition that day. Who's the best dressed pet? Little Johnny was so excited and went home. School bus comes and little Johnny wasn't ready. Mom yells out, you're going to miss the school bus again. Said, I'm still getting ready. And then another time she goes, look, you missed the school bus. And yeah, she's yelling. And finally she comes screaming up the stairs. She goes, you've missed the school bus. How many times did I do? What's wrong with you? Said, mom, be patient. I'm still putting Carl's shoes on. <laughs> so cool. That's funny. I don't care who you are there. So me, I'm going, putting shoes Carl's shoes on. You know, patience comes in many different ways and, and many different forms, and God gives us opportunities to do that. You got your Bibles out? I'm there now. James chapter 5. Six times in these verses. Hey, six times in these six verses, James is going to make reference to this, this word patience. We're going to look at the Greek word. It's not going to help us out, but we're going to look at that Greek word. It's going to help us a little bit. We're going to look at that Greek word in a little while, but we're going to explain that six times. And I want you to circle these words. You've got that in your notes. The only thing in your notes you should have is just the scripture verses. A little different. Day. I'm just going to talk today. It's really not, it's going to be a teaching time, but there's not like one, two, three, four, five, six things. It's just going to be a couple things I want to say, but there's going to be a ton of scripture verses. So I hope you write these down. But I want you to circle every time we get to this word patience, and also uses another word that's very similar in the Greek, and it's steady steadfast and steadfastness. He's going to talk about being steadfast, but he's also going to be talking about the steadfastness of Job. Somebody want to read that? I want you to circle those words when we get to that word. Glory, you're up. You got this version or no? Can you see that far? Yeah, I can see Okay. Thank you. 
Yeah. Okay. Let's go back to verse 7, would you? Ayla, go back to verse 7 up there. No, it says twice, circle in your bulletin there, twice patience, and then verse 8, twice, uh, uh, patient, verse 10, patient, then in verse uh, next, they're steadfast, and then finally the steadfastness of Job. Circle those are th- six times. You think, you know, think James, who the Holy Spirit's trying to get a message across? You all kind of got that, right? Repetition? He talks about this. So, Remember what I told you about the book of James. The book of James is not this theological, doctrinal type of approach, but it's practical lifestyle, how to live this out. So, so what we're going to do, we're going to break this down. We're only going to take number one because that's, this is a tough one anyway. How does faith work patiently when we are suffering? And then we're going to look at the four Ds. When, how does faith work patiently when we go through disapproval, disappointment, disaster, and dishonesty. Now listen up. Yeah, this next question, you don't have any notes there, but this next question, the way that you determine that and interpret that will determine how you handle suffering and hardships and trials in your walk of faith. How you handle this next question will determine how you handle your walk of faith in struggles and in hardship and in testing. Let's look at that question. Here it is. I've heard this a lot. If God is all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-good, then why is there, what? Evil and sufferings. Have you noticed every day, if you turn your television on, radio on, whatever you do, newspaper, we're bombarded by this avalanche of evil news. Have you you noticed everything? You know, that sells, by the way. You do not understand that, you know. The, 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 the crazier the story is of human behavior, the more papers sell. And so they emphasize that about, about whether, it's, whether it's just, you know, murder or stealing or deadly diseases or, or whatever, world crisis. We, we see this over and over and over. Just, and I thought about this. I said, why is this? Is our world really getting all that evil? Most of us in this room would say what? Yeah. You remember your parents? Remember they'd, they'd sit around and, and you'd listen to them. They'd say, I don't know what this world's coming to. It's just, you know, going to hell in a handbasket. Remember that? Remember that? I don't know about you. I, I, I had grandparents and I thought, boy, they're depressing people, you know. They sit around and talk about the aches. Once they get past the aches and pain, then they talk about those young people. They're talking about me, you know, long-haired. And, you know, anyway. And, and, but, but here's what I thought about this. You know, our our technology has advanced so much in the last few years, right? And so now all of this news and all this technology is out there. I mean, it's all out there. I mean, there's, you know, every story, every evil thing, every bad thing, every shooting is reported in minutes right after this because of our technology. And so we're bombarded with all this. And what does that do to you? Does it make you sick at your stomach? Yes. Yes. If you've got any sense of consciousness about you, you'd say, it makes me sick in my stomach. I, I've lost faith in humanity. And then I thought, I wonder how God sees this. He's been watching this for a long time, hasn't he? Right? And he sees everything. I mean, nothing goes without his knowledge. I really believe that. I, I, I'm so confident about that. He sees every little thing. The Bible says that when a sparrow drops from the sky, he knows that. Right? And so so if, if, if that's true, and I, I believe absolutely the Word of God being inerrant. Whatever the Word of God says, I believe that. Amen? Aren't you glad? Yes. Aren't you glad you have a pastor that just says, I, I, I believe that? I, I, okay. Y'all catch up with me later. All right. And so think about God. I mean, just think about it. He sees all this. And what do you think that, what do you think God feels here? In Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 and following, it says, The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth. And every, every imagination, every intention of his thought, of his heart, was all kinds, all kinds of evil. He saw it. And then it says this, he regretted that he made man and it grieved his heart. Wow. Here's here's what God's saying. God didn't intend this. That was not his design. And he says it's wrong what's happening. He's angered about that. And he's grieved about what is going on 
with the sufferings and the sins and, and the evilness that's, that's on these days. Listen, even if you don't believe in the existence of God, you, you still have an inner conscience. And, and if somebody who's an atheist that can look at this world and an atheist who does not believe in the existence of God would say, our world is in trouble, right? In, in our world, I, I'm angered at our world because of, of the sin and, and the evilness that's going on here and the suffering that's going on here. Even an atheist who does not believe in the existence of God still has this consciousness about what is going on and it's, and it's bad and it's wrong. The same feelings and heart that God has about what's going on. Do y'all see this? Because God, the Bible says that, that God made man in what? His image. And he made us this way. And so to me, now watch this now, because when we take this sentence up here, and, and some people say, well, if, if, if there's suffering in this world, you know, if God is all loving and all knowing, why is there suffering? And, and look how God handles this. He's upset with this too. He's disappointed with this too. And he's angered about this. And so to me, the opposite is true, is that, you know, this turning, this turning to God saying, why is God this way, is an indication that there's a recognition that there is good and there is evil and the existence of God is real. They just don't know that. I don't think y'all understood what I said there. Maybe I didn't explain that well, but, but eat, chew on that a little bit, okay? Because that just proves just the opposite. If you're, if you're talking to somebody who, who, who says this and just... Two weeks ago, I dealt with somebody who said this. And I, and I said, even your questioning gives evidence that you really believe in God. Because if there's no God, why does it really matter, right? You hear what I'm saying now? Does that make sense now? Okay. Can I move on? You don't want me to stay here for a while. Some of y'all don't care. I'm good. I'm good with it. Well. So here's what happened to me. In my, so I really struggled with this message. In fact, you know, Roxy didn't get my notes, uh, you know, uh, you know, Melissa didn't get my notes till last night or no, yesterday morning. And uh, because I struggled because I, I thought if I'm going to teach this, I need to tell you all about, you know, about suffering and get a good biblical understanding with this. But this is not what James does. This, James talks about how do we live with this and how do we work faith in the midst of suffering. In a couple of months, when we get through with the book of James, I want to talk about this. And here's what? Oh, well, it's funny. Did I miss something? Oh, we're going to get through, James? I don't think we are in a couple of months. We'll have an altar call today, and so I want y'all. Here's what I want to talk about. How, how suffering points to God's existence. Believe it or not. How did suffering enter our world? God's will in suffering. Jesus, Jesus shows through suffering how much God really cares through suffering. And why do we suffer as Christians? Now remember what I said, how we handle this sentence up here, this mystery of evil, will determine how we handle suffering and how we have a walk of faith in our suffering. All right, you ready? Let me give you some things here. We're going to look at the five ways the world looks at suffering, and then we're going to look at one way Christians ought to look at suffering. Y'all ready? So you not in your notes. If you want to write these down, that'd be great. If you don't, then just, just hang on. We'll get through this eventually. First of all, because of suffering and evil and pain, some of our world says, well, there must be not a God. There's no God. That's called atheism, right? There's no God. We kind of talked about this. And, and so there's no answers for that, uh, for suffering that happens, is there? There's no comfort with that. Well, there's just no God. So we're kind of left on our own. And the solution, solution for this is suicide. Well, I'm just going to end my life because it really doesn't matter. There's no God. There's no eternalness after that. So I'm in a lot of pain and suffering. I'm just going to end my life because there's no God. And that's the answer for that. It gives us an answer. If there's no God, then, then we're left our own. And we all know mankind, right? We're, we're pretty, pretty rotten. We're going to do rotten things. Okay? Another reason, because of suffering, evil, and pain in our world... So people say, well, God is not all-knowing. He's not, that's called open theism and process theology. Process theology is uh, by this guy named Whitehead and, and developed this, said, well, God is just this changing God. 
You know, he, he, he's just, he, he's, he processes everything. And as he processes, he develops more and more, <laughs> you know. And uh, it's kind of like man has a free will. And because man has a free will, that dictates the history of mankind. God doesn't have a plan. God, God doesn't know everything. God doesn't presume everything. God doesn't order everything. It's just that mankind develops. And as we develop, God kind of develops in our image of who we think God is. Pretty crazy, huh? By the way, 25% of the Bible, 25% of God's Word deals with propheticness. God does have a plan. Amen? Aren't you glad? Contrary to the Word of God, God does know everything and God does have a plan. The third thing is God is not all-powerful. That's finite Godism. In other words, God is love and, and, and you know God is good, but what He did, He created the world and just kind of left it and just said, y'all do the best you can. You know, and so, so he's, he's not all powerful. He's not going to, he, he, he kind of cares, but he says, just like a doctor who comes in and says, you know, I, I care about you, but there's nothing I can do for you. You know, what kind of hope is that? There's zero hope in that, right? So some people believe this and embrace this. That's the world's explanation of why there's so much suffering and pain in the world. <clears throat> God's just not that powerful to correct it. He can't do it. Contrary to the word of God. Amen? You with me so far? Number whatever. God is not all good. That's uh, panthe pantheism and panentheism, and basically they're the same. They kind of relate to the, the process theology that we mentioned just a while ago. And uh, what that, you know, the yin and yang, you know what that is, don't you? Uh, you know, the circle of life, you've heard that, you know, the movie, what, what is that movie, Lion King, the circle of life. So, so, so what, what is that saying here is that God is not all that good, and sometimes he's good, and sometimes He's evil. So all of good and evil is wrapped up in God. It's kind of a yin and yang. God, if, if, when God is good, then good things happen. When God is bad, just stay in bed. That's kind of that, right? The yin and yang. God is, is not all good. Number five. Some people just, uh, pluralism, which says there is no suffering or evil. At first glance, that just looks, What? Pluralism believes whatever you interpret good is good, and whatever you interpret bad is bad. My interpretation of this, you may say is bad, but I say it's good. Whether it's lifestyle, whether it's conduct, do you get where I'm going with this? It's, it's a true, isn't it? A lot of people believe there's no, not good evil. Why would we say there's no right or wrong? Do you hear that? There's no right or wrong. That's pluralism. There's no really evil. Buddhism really says that, that reality is an illusion. It's just an illusion. It's not real. So you can kind of feel whatever you want to, make of it whatever you want to. It's just that Hindu mythology, Buddhism type of thought. It's just our life doesn't really, doesn't matter good or bad. It's all God. <laughs> Number next. Here's where we have to land this. God is not done yet, so patiently live by faith. And that's where we're going to find James. Now listen to me. We know God is good. Let's, let's give rebuttal to this. We know God is good. The Bible says that God is light, and in him there is what? No darkness. He, God is good. God is all-knowing. Bible says that he, he Bible says that he has a plan for you and the plan is to to prosper you to to invest in you so God does have a plan he's all powerful he's called Lord master we know just the terminology of that master Lord means that he is ruler over all things creation and those things in the spiritual world and those things that are tangible for us and we understand that there's no suffering and all that. So, so we, all, we all have this. Now, here's what I want to talk about because I need a little Jesus in this, right? I need a lot of Jesus in this. The Bible clearly defines who Jesus is. He is a suffering servant. Isaiah chapter 50, Isaiah chapter 52, Isaiah chapter 53, the book of Mark, half of the book of Mark, there's 16 chapters in the book of Mark, and half of the chapters in the book of Mark are dedicated to this idea that Jesus is a suffering servant unto us. 
he suffered. And we understand that. We understand that the cross was the climax of, of Jesus' suffering. All that he came to do is found at Calvary in the suffering of innocent blood, in the accusation of his criminalness, of all of those things, of us, of him taking on sin and, and being forsaken by his Father, and all of sin and all of mankind, and all the sin and the painfulness that we go through. Jesus took that to the cross. He is called the suffering servant, right? And we see that. Now what's this? So after Jesus is crucified, I must step out of this. If I was God, and after Jesus fulfilled by the sacrifice, by the death of him, then I would have just opened up heaven. I'd had trumpets sound. I had great rock bands playing this great loud music, you know, drums, guitars, because I love electric guitars. And I mean, it would be a fan fed that all of those mockers and all of those who crucified him and all of those doubters, all those ones that said crucify him, rejected him, and the disciples and the believers also included would see how God treats suffering. He overcomes it. But he didn't do it. He goes to the tomb for how many days? Three days. What's that about? I think there's a message there. And I think the message is, what about the disciples during this time? Well, this isn't working out. You know, he died. Do you think they felt anger because of the rejection and the pain and the suffering that was caused to Jesus? Yes. Do you think they were disappointed? Yes. Do you think their hopes and dreams were all broken because they said, man, this is not working? Well, I don't think, do you think they might have thought this? I don't know. Maybe he's not all that powerful or all loving. Maybe God isn't all loving. Do you think they might have thought that in that pain and suffering? And so there's a waiting period, right? Now, see, all of us know we're on the other side of, we're on, we're on the, other side of the resurrection, right? We know the rest of the story, right? do we? Everybody know the rest of the story? Did the, did the grave contain Jesus Christ? Absolutely not. Is there victory over death? Absolutely. Is the sting of death removed over all? Absolutely. Is there victory through the, through the blood of Jesus Christ? Absolutely. Is there eternal life? Absolutely. Is he sitting on the right hand of the throne of the Father? Absolutely. We know all that. But in that meantime, there's waiting. And it's hard. But you know what? You know what that tells me? In that period, when he comes out, he said, I'm not done yet. Isn't that good news? Isn't that good news, church? Is that not good news? I'm not done yet. And he comes out. Ta da! <laughs> it's kind of like when my grandson got out of the bathtub. He goes, Ta da! I'm clean. You know, like, Ta da! I don't even, what, to, what is ta da? Is that a Spanish word? No, it ain't a Spanish word. Ta da! It's a Greek word. And so, so, you know, he comes out, and, and, and then they go, he's not done yet. And so there's hope, right? And that's, that's where we find this scripture, right here. I, I, I mean, we find it right here on the other side of the resurrection. I'm not done yet, so you can trust. You can be faithful. You don't give up. Be patient. Be patient. So let's look at this. Okay, let's go back to James chapter 7, verse, uh, James chapter 5, verse 7. All right? Let's break this down. Some of you are going, he's just now getting to the text. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. James chapter 5, verse 7. We got that up there? Yeah. Notice what it says. Be patient. Therefore, brothers. And by the way, some, some of y'all's translation may and sisters. And that's, that's absolutely correct there. And sisters, brothers and sisters. So, so you sisters out there, y'all are included in this, all right? Be patient, therefore. Brothers and sisters, until the coming of the Lord. Now, we've got to know what's the therefore, therefore, you know. The therefore, therefore is you've got to look up in those verses right above that. And he just described about being taken advantage of, about working. And we talked about this last Sunday, about families who, who worked for the harvest. And, and then the owner of the farms didn't pay them. And they're not sure they're going to live because they don't have any money. They were day workers. They depended on that paycheck. And now they said, we're not paying you. So you talk about suffering and death. Their children may not be fed. That's the seriousness of this, okay? There's some injustice, unfair injustice that's happened to them. He says, therefore, be patient. 
That, that doesn't really set well to me. Can we not be vengeful? Can we not say, let's sue them, let's take them to court? And there may be a place for that, but not here, not this time. There's a point to this. He said, he said therefore, even though you've been injustice and evil and, and, and maybe even murderous, we looked at that. It says, you know, you, somebody can die because of this malice and this evil that you caused and this suffering, and I didn't do anything. I was faithful to do my job, and, and you did this to me. And then he says, what does he say? Therefore, what? Be patient. Really? James, that's all you got? <laughs> I'm just being real. Be, that's all you got. Somebody rips you off, steals from you, hurts you, oppresses you, disrupts your family life. You may not be able to feed your children. You're not sure if you're going to go live with your in-laws. Lord help you. Okay, you know, you're getting the gist here? And, and James says, be patient. Now, let's, let's, let's make this a little more personal in your life. What's happened to you? It's caused you to suffer. That you've not done yourself. All right? I mean, we, we do enough infliction to hurt us, right? But we're talking about outside infliction. Some of you, you know, just, you know, you're, you're fired for no reason. You're abandoned for something. As a child, you didn't pick your parents, but they were abusive to you. They were hard on you. They were whether emotionally, physically, whatever. Neglected you. Just weren't there, whatever. You got, a, you got past there that you, you suffered through. And there's still some, some tendencies maybe to go back there when, when the flesh rises up in you. And you're not led by the Spirit of God. You've been married, and, and the person comes up and says, I want a divorce from you. I'm out of here. I found somebody else. Okay, we got scar tissue from that. we got scar tissue from being fired and, and abandoned. Whatever it is, personalize that just for a moment. And what is that suffering? And probably in your life, you marked that as a historical moment of your life, a life-changing moment. And maybe you're not over it. So, so I look at this, and I go, and the scripture tells me to be patient. Man, I need a Greek word on this one. I need to understand the Greek word. This Surely the Greek word is going to help me out of this and give me some more fortitude and, and some just as well. Let me give you this Greek word. I think I have it up there. Makrothumiai. Anybody got holy chill bumps off of that word? No. Well, that means long-suffering. It's the opposite of anger and what's this? Here it comes, retaliation. Often associated with mercy. Mercy means what? Not getting what you really deserve. That's, what the, that's the definition of mercy. Not getting what you really deserve. And so, so, so I read this word and I go, that, that, that still, that didn't help me. That word did not help me in being patient about not retaliating. Okay, I won't retaliate. I won't get them in the headlock. I won't, I won't throw something at them. I won't scream at them. I'll, I'll just, I'm just going to settle, but I'm still suffering. Maybe I, not on the outside, I got this, God. And I'm telling you, that, that didn't help me that much. So now, as I was studying, preparing this, I thought, I need some Jesus in this, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm just working my way through how I prepare a sermon. I need some Jesus in this one because this is not helping. You know, somebody did this to me, and somebody has done some things for this, you know? I've, I've been... I've, I've gone through stuff in my life, you know, and so I, I need some Jesus in, in this suffering here for my anger, my shutdown, and my depression. Here it is, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18 through 24. It's lengthy, but I won't, it is so dadgum good. It is so good. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also... To the unjust, those that rip you off, those that are mean, those that are injustice to, those that show evil in this world, suffering. For this is a gracious thing, the mindful of God, one endures sorrow while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and you're beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Now check the rest of this. This is where it really rubber meets the road. For the this you've been called because Christ, what? Also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Now, here's, here's my favorite verse right here. Here it is. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. I'm sorry, verse 23. For he was reviled, he did not revile in return. And when he suffered, he did not threaten. But he continued to, what's this, what's this? Entrusting 
himself to him who judge justly. What? Did y'all see it? We're talking about Jesus. Jesus who endured more suffering than all of us combined in this room. Agreed? Okay. How did he handle it? Did he retaliate? Could he? Could he call a, a, a legion of angels down and wipe them all out like my story would have been? He didn't do it. He didn't retaliate. What's that about? Did he suffer? Absolutely. Hideous, criminal things happened to Jesus. And, and notice what he did. Notice that, that last part. Go, well, he didn't say bore our sins and body on the tree that we might die for sin. Righteous said by his womb you've been healed. Let's go back to verse 23. That's the key. Verse 23. Look at this. But he continued what? Jesus continued what? Entrusting himself to God who will one day judge judgely. Did y'all get that? I had to chew on that a while. And the more I thought about that, it is, is that he committed himself to God, the righteous judge, and in his suffering that he learned, that is in our suffering that we learn also, like Jesus, learn to commit ourselves to God in this time of suffering. And that's what Jesus did in our example. Now, follow me now, okay? When Jesus suffered, he didn't have to do that, right? Right? Okay, y'all help me out here. So, so he didn't have to suffer, but he chose to suffer. He chose to suffer. Why? And in that suffering, he gives us an example that in suffering, he continually committed himself to the Father. You know why? He said, one day, all the wrongs will be righted. One day, there will be a day of judgment. And that's what James is going to talk about. One day, there's going to be a day of judgment. And that's not my job. My job is to commit myself during the suffering time and not to waver from that, but continually commit myself unto my Heavenly Father who is the judge. I'm not the judge. He is. And one day that's going to happen. One day it's going to happen. And so that's our example. Do you hear that? Our example is Jesus committing ourselves in times of suffering. You know why? Because it ain't over yet. God's going to have the final word, and that's the good news. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8. Hebrews chapter 5 says, although Jesus was a son, he learned obedience from the things that he suffered. Can I read that again? That's a crazy verse there. That Jesus was a son, son of God, and he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. Now, wait a minute. Jesus is perfect, right? And he learned obedience, he, you know? What, what that's saying is, is that perfect knowledge, he had this perfect knowledge, became perfect in his suffering. In other words, he demonstrated. Remember what I told you about that? The intellectual versus experiential. You can know this and believe this and have truth and be perfect in that understanding of who God is and how you're to conduct your life. But it is, it is perfected and shown as you live it out. Does that make sense now, that verse? And that's what that verse means. Jesus was always perfect in his understanding. But it was per perfected the way that he lived out as an example to us. Wembley Christian Church, this is for us. The Lord who suffered and rose again, who understands what it is to suffer, it says, commit yourself and continue to commit yourself. Because why? He's coming back again. He's coming again. There's tons of scripture verses, and I gave a list up here. Uh, I don't think I'm going to read those. I think, I think I've got a list here. They'll, they'll be in the sermon notes. It will be on the deal. If you want to look at there's a ton of scripture verses that just talks about the coming of Jesus Christ. And, and the whole gist of all these scripture verses that I have for you up there is, is that, that in our day-to-day -day living, our horizon must not be just pinpointed on the things that are wrong. Our horizon as believers must be, pin, must be visionary to see through the sufferings, through the pain and all this, to see the horizon. And the horizon tells me that if we look to the east one day, the Son of God is coming back for his children. Amen? He's coming back again. He's coming back again. And that gives me hope. That keeps me faithful. That keeps me committed to the purpose of the Lord. Be patient because the Lord is coming. Secondly, be patient. The harvest is coming. Let's look at the last verse here and we're almost done. All right, verses 7 and B. Be patient because the harvest is coming. That's 7B. I can read it here. 
I'll just read on it. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. And then notice the farmer illustration. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until he receives early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your heart, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Clement was this uh, uh, Greek uh, believer in, 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 uh, in the, in the uh, 150 AD, something around there. And he was the father, founder of a lot of churches. And he wrote about James and Jude. They were brothers, Jesus' half-brothers. And he said they were farmers. And so we see this illustration where James is kind of given this, this uh, Palestinian agricultural illustration here. He says that, that a farmer would plant the seeds and, and, the, and, and like where I grew up in West Texas, it was all just dirt and mountainous and the terrain wasn't that good. But a farmer was very dependent on the rainy seasons. October, November was one. And then April and May was the second rainy seasons. And they were very dependent on the rains to give uh, nutrients and water and all that stuff to, to those plants that they had planted. Now, a farmer had to patiently wait for those rains. Could he change or alter anything of those seasons? Yes or no? That's a no. Absolutely. And here's what, here's what James is trying to tell us with this illustration. Like a farmer who patiently waits for those rains, that one day the Lord is going to come, and we've got to be patient in that because he is going to come. And when he comes, there's going to be a harvest a harvest. Now, yeah. now, what does that mean? Well, a, a foolish fa a farmer in, 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 the, in the struggle and the sorrow and the anguish, once he plants this and he looks at that and it's not growing. It's kind of like what Gerald and I were talking about. They, they came over the house and planted some plants and I've got some that just aren't growing. And Gerald said, what did you do, Gary? You know, I'm not sure what that meant. Just kidding. He didn't say that. Did you say that? He almost did. Anyway, and I go, I watered them twice a day, and I talked to them, and I, they became my best friends, and, and, and they still died, you know. So, so, you know, it's like a farmer who plants, is dependent on these rains, he can't do anything about it. So the farmer, in frustration, he goes, I'm just going to pull everything out. And his wife comes out there and says, it's only been three weeks. Well, I expect harvest. Now, how foolish would that be? It would be kind of like if you planted a peach tree, and, and it bloomed. One week, and the next week, you expect fruit to go pick out there. And if it didn't, you just cut it down, right? No. There's a process here. Do you kind of get what I'm saying? By the way, you're going to be fruitful too in due season and, and all this. And so there's a harvest that's coming. And here's, here's, why, here's, here's why God is so slow in the harvest. Why doesn't he come? Everybody want Jesus to come back today? Uh-oh. Does anybody want Jesus to come back today? I do. Yeah. You know, but why is he so slow? You ever think about that? Here's the reason right here. First, it's found in 1 Peter, I think. Yeah, 1 Peter 3. What? Huh? Yeah. Do we have that verse? Well, I got it. Take a ride over there. This, this, this verse ought to be marked. 2 Peter, I'm sorry, 3, 3 9. 2 Peter 3 9. Listen, the Lord is what? Not slow. To fulfill his promises as some count slowness. But what? He is what? There it is. Long suffering. You know? You feel like as a parent, how am I going to put up with these kids? Oh my gosh. You know? Yeah. Long suffering toward you. Not wishing that what? It should perish, but that what? And there it is. And there it is. And there it is. He is that shepherd. He has 99 sheep. And one's lost, and he goes out and finds it. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? What if, for some of y'all, because we baptized a bunch of y'all. They're, they're not here today, but anyway, we, we baptized several in this room. What if Jesus came five years ago? What would that mean to you? Right? So, so, so he's slow. He's, he's slow because one day the harvest is going to come, and, and that's it. And so one day when that harvest comes, there's, there's no more chance. You know the most important day of your life is the day you die because that determines your eternity. Do you understand that? You better be ready. There's no take backs on that. The day you die is the most important day of your life. 
So, so let me show you this last verse and then we'll go home, okay? James chapter 5, verse 8. I want to read this to you because it's a really cool verse, I think. I love this book. I have fallen in love with James so much over and over. And I, every time I read, I get something out of it. In fact, I reread it. I went backwards and just to kind of come into this message, this launching pad of suffering. Verse 8, you also be patient. Establish your hearts. In other words, make solid. In other words, I like some scholars said, put iron in your heart. Put some substance in your heart. Be strong in your heart. Don't be wishy-washy, but put some iron in your heart. Take courage and have an attitude of fortitude. Establish your heart for the coming of the Lord. What? The hand. Let me read this quote by Campbell Morgan. Got that up there? Let me see that quote. To me, the second coming is a perpetual light on the path which makes the present bearable. Do y'all hear that? Listen, when Jesus comes back, and he's going to come back, all pain, all sorrow will stop. Every bit of it will stop. And so the stuff that I go through, when I wake up in the morning, Lord, is today the day you're going to come back and you can interrupt my life and my plans? Please do. Lord, I've worked on this sermon this morning. I've worked on this sermon, but Lord, if you want to come back today, you have my blessings. <laughs> I said, Lord, come, please come. Maybe after I preach, but, but you know, do you hear what I'm saying? It makes it bearable here. Here's my final word. The Lord is coming. There will be a harvest. There will be a day of judgment. Believers, all of all the wrongs, all the injustice, all the suffering will be satisfied because Jesus, the perfect Lamb of God, suffered and died and took all of our judgment, all of our sin on Him. Do you understand that? If you're not a believer, you are on a road, a path to God's wrath. We are marching toward this day of judgment, all of us. And if you don't know God and you stand before him, I thought about this. What about those that, because this, this person that said this to me, so, well, I, I, don't, I don't know if I could ever trust a God who allows suffering. And I've heard that so many times. I get that. We're going to talk about that in a couple of months. So I've got an explanation for that. Maybe help us as believers to communicate that because we ought to be a witness. And, and I thought about, you know, on that, on that journey, you know, what, what about that? I think when we stand before God, listen to me, when we stand before God, the Bible says we're going to be standing as if we were naked. In other words, we, we do not have an excuse or a barrier or something to hide behind saying this statement. Well, I didn't believe in you and I didn't trust you because of all the evil. How can a loving God? You know why we will not be able to have that excuse? You know why? Because the Lamb of God is there. The one who took away sin. The Bible says in Revelation that all of heaven screams out, who is worthy enough to open up this book? And no one, no one could do, not an angel, not, not no. And then, and then the Lamb of God stood, the one who was sacrificed for the perfect Lamb of God, who still has those sins, who still has those wounds as a reflection of his suffering and sacrifice for us. And if anyone is standing there before God and said, well, you know, I, I just couldn't trust you and believe you because, you know, God who allowed suffering in that lamb, the Lamb of God, Jesus will stand up. I did that for you. I did that for you. There'll be no excuses. If you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're on a road right now, a path to his wrath and judgment. And that's on you. So here's what I want to say. James tells us right here that God saw sin, he saw suffering in this world, and he acted on it. And he became a sin sacrifice, suffering for us so that we would not spend eternity suffering anymore. And that's the answer. So here's our hope, church. I'm, I'm done. Our hope is this. Be patient because the Lord is coming and he will have a harvest. And I want to be a part of that harvest of his righteousness. Amen? Yes. All right. Well, that's all I got. <laughs> let's, let's just pray. 
Father, we, we ask you to help us to be patient because you're not done yet. Father, you, you, have, the final, you, you have the final voice in our lives in our sufferings, in our struggles, in our questions, you have the final say-so. And your say-so is good enough. You're more than enough for us. So Lord, today we, we commit ourselves to you in our sufferings. That's right. In the midst of our sufferings, we commit ourselves to you. We thank you that Jesus showed us how to do this. And we're going to stay the course and be patient and not waver. Have fortitude and iron in our heart. Courage in our spirit that we will stand strong until you come once again. And we pray for those who are not yet believers. And whatever excuse they may have, even this morning, that they would say, well, hell, they won't stay up in a court in heaven. Father, thank you that Jesus took all of our sins and all of our sorrows and all of our pains. He took death and sin for our behalf. Lord, we thank you for that. We're so undeserving, and yet you chose us. We're so grateful for that this day. Father, the very least we could do is in this world serve you completely and not be distracted by hurts and sorrows and sideway things that just disrupt. Help us to be patient, to know that you're not done yet. And this process gives great delight in your eyes. We ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, one of my favorite stories is, is, uh, as a kid was the story when, you know, the guys were in the boat, the disciples were in the boat. Y'all know that story? You know, the disciples are in the boat and... And the uh, storm comes, and then Jesus kind of walks on the water, you know, and then Peter tries it, you know, it didn't work out well for him. That was the first baptism of the disciples, and uh, he goes under. And um, you know the thing about that story, just real quick? Yeah, I'm overdue, aren't I? I'm a little long. Um, the, the thing about who told them to get in that boat? Jesus told them to get in the boat, Right? He says, you guys get in the boat. I'm going to stay here. I'm going to hang out on the shoreline. And, and then the story would not be highlighted in the Bible if they got in the boat and got to Capernaum and that was in the story. But the story is highlighted because what happened? A storm, right? And who told him to get in the boat? Jesus told him to get in the boat knowing that what? A storm was brewing. Did y'all hear that? So what's this? And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this just to help you out. I'll, this is free. I'm on overtime now. But if, if, if the destination is the goal for us, then we're going to miss out. But it's the process that gives God the glory. Is that good? And so this process of getting here to there, it's not getting there is the glory. So... It's, it's this process of getting there because God told him, Jesus told him to get in the boat and in this process, this amazing story takes place and that's true in our lives. We hate this process because we just want, you know, let's all go to heaven. Well, we're not going to heaven today, maybe. We might, but, but in this process, we give honor and glory to God. Does that make sense? That's, I want to develop that a little bit more, but, but I've just been thinking about it. I shared that with Billy Nan, and she got saved twice during that time. And, and so I, I, I want to develop that a little bit more because I think we all struggle with that. I struggle with this. I just wanted to be there as a pastor. I didn't realize something in between here would change my life. And I'm here, I'm here because of this process, not because of that destination, because that destination was different. That didn't make sense. But anyway, uh, 
That was free. And I think as we struggle and we suffer and we all through that, we just say, get me out of this. And yet God says, uh-uh, uh-uh. The process is going to change your life, not just bailing you out. Amen? Amen. That was free. All right. We have communion, don't we? Uh, we uh, trust the Lord, if you're a believer, just to uh, join, join with us in this communion. I love communion. Uh, let's pray. Esther, would you voice our communion prayer, please?